Hello, and welcome to Differential Equations. This is Lecture 16, Laplace Transform. Last time, we saw that if T is a differential operator, right, linear, And we know the general solution to the homogeneous problem ty equals zero. We can use variation of parameters to solve the non-homogeneous problem ty equals f. This time, we're going to go over a different approach. to so solving problems like ty equals f, we're going to go back to assuming that T has constant coefficients. This approach, we will be turning the analytic problem we want to solve to an algebraic problem. This approach will be particularly useful if the forcing term has jump discontinuities. Okay, so this technique is known as the Laplace transform. We'll start by defining that. So suppose that f of t is a function defined on the interval zero to infinity. And we're going to assume two things about this function. On the one hand, we don't want it to grow too quickly. So we want it to grow at most like an exponential function. So we'll say that it is of exponential order. And what we mean technically is that there are constants Let's call them capital M and R, such that the absolute value of the function is bounded above by M times E to the RT. Right. So again, all, all we're asking for is that the function doesn't grow too quickly. And the second thing we're going to ask is that it be piecewise continuous. Right, which is to say continuous except for jump discontinuities and we don't want to have too many too many jump discontinuities. Okay, but assuming the function satisfies those two requirements, then we define the Laplace transform of f 
to be a new function right so curly l applied to f right this is a function we're going to call its um argument s instead of the argument t for for little f and what you do is you integrate from zero to infinity e to the minus st times f of t dt right so notice that the integrand depends on both s and t but you integrate out the t so at the end you end up with a function just of s right it's common to, to talk about uh, pairs where you have your initial function, little f, and then the Laplace transform is capital F, right? So we'll use both notations, both the curly L of little f and the capital F, right? Um, with the two assumptions we've made, uh, this function is defined for s larger than r, right? Where this r, I mean the r in this exponential bound and satisfies that the limit as s goes to zero, not zero, s goes to infinity of uh, capital F s is equal to zero. Okay, so that shows you that not every function is the Laplace transform of some other function because you have to have uh, decay as you go out to infinity. Um, okay, so before we do uh, examples, let's mention some, some important properties. First, Laplace transform is linear. Right, so what linear means is uh, this has two properties. One, if I take the sum of two functions and then I take the Laplace transform, I get the sum of the Laplace transforms. Right, and secondly, if, if you multiply a function by a constant and then take the Laplace transform, you get a, that constant times the Laplace transform of the function. Okay, another important property. So this linearity is really easy to check. Just plug in f plus g into the integral or c times f into the integral and check that you get the right-hand side. Uh, something that's much more complicated to check but is a key fact is that the Laplace transform is invertible, right? There is a formula for the inverse of the Laplace transform, but this formula involves a contour integral in the complex plane. So it's not something we're gonna discuss in this class. That's okay, even without a formula for the inverse, it's still extremely useful to know that the Laplace transform is invertible because it means that you can recognize a function by recognizing its Laplace transform. And that's something we're going to be doing a lot of to solve differential equations. Okay, so with those initial properties out of the way, let's look at some examples. Okay, so first let's say that your function is an exponential, e to the sigma t, then the Laplace transform the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st times e to the sigma t, right? Which we can just write as e to the sigma minus s times t, right? And so here we get one over s minus sigma 
as long as s is greater than sigma, right? So just like we anticipated here, if you have a certain uh, growth rate, then uh, that tells you where the Laplace transform is going to be defined. So in this case, if you have e to the sigma t, then this is defined as long as s is greater than sigma. Okay, a related example. Suppose that f of t is cosine of some multiple of t, let's say omega times t, right? What we can do is we can write this using Euler's formula in terms of exponentials with complex exponents. Right? So this is the real part of e to the i omega t. And then using linearity of the Laplace transform, we see the Laplace transform of cosine omega t is one half of one over s minus omega t plus one over s plus omega t. Right? That's because this formula that we worked out also works if sigma is in a complex number. And if you work that out, you get s over s squared plus omega squared, right? Notice that um, sometimes we write uh, L of f of s, and sometimes we just write L of the function. That's just like sometimes we write f, and sometimes we write f of t, okay? So of course, if we've done cosine, we should also do sine. Similarly, the Laplace transform of sine of omega t is omega divided by s squared plus omega squared. Right. Uh, let's also do, say, f of t is equal to the constant function, 1. Then its Laplace transform is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times 1 times dt. Right, and so that integral is just one over s. If f of t is equal to t, then the Laplace transform would be the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus s t of t dt, right? And that one, if you do an integration by parts, you can see that it's one over s squared. Okay, um, perhaps more interesting, or at least different, let's do the heavy side function. Okay, so this is a function named after um, Oliver Heaviside, a uh, self-taught mathematician uh, from England. Uh, who did a lot of work on applications to engineering, especially electrical engineering. And so he, uh, we named this function after him. So this is just like a jump function. It's zero if t is less than zero, and it's one if t is greater than or equal to one, right? So you can put the jump wherever you like. If you do h of t minus a, then this will be zero, for t less than a, and it'll be one if t is greater than or equal to a. All right, so you can think of, of the heavy side function as like a switch that's open for t less than a in this case, and it is closed for t greater than a. Okay, so Laplace transform of h of t minus a is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st times the heavy side function evaluated at t minus a times dt, right? So this is a really easy integral to do. You just write it as the sum of two integrals, right? So from zero to a, the heavy side function is just zero. And then from a onwards, the heavy side function is just one. Right? So, of course, this integral is zero, and this integral is very much like the Laplace transform of one, 
we end up with e to the minus a s divided by s. Okay, so how that shows up is you might have, say, a function that is three between zero and two, and then it jumps to five between two and three, and then it jumps to zero if t is greater than three. Right. So what you can do is just write this in terms of the Heaviside functions, right? So it's three times h of t, right? So that gets us the three, but it would give us three here and three here as well. So we need to modify that. So let's add five minus three times the Heaviside function of t minus two, right? So that'll get us the right value here and the right value here. So we just need to modify it to make sure this happens. And so then you can just add zero minus five. So, you know, just change the values that you want to change to and from times h of t minus three, right? So, then the Laplace transform would be three over S plus two times E to the minus two S divided by S and then plus or rather minus five times E to the minus three S divided by S. Okay. Um, Notice that if you take the Laplace transform of an exponential times some other function, then you get the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st times the exponential times the other function, right? Which is just the integral from zero to infinity of e to the sigma minus s times t times this other function, right? So you notice that this is just like the integral defining the Laplace transform, except that instead of having e to the minus st, we have e to the sigma minus st. So all we've done is modify the s. So this is just the Laplace transform of f, but evaluated on s minus sigma. Okay, so the way to think about this computation is that it's saying that if you on the input side, multiply by an exponential, then on the output side, what you've done is shift the function. All right, a similar useful formula is that if you take your initial function and multiply it by a heavy side function, so by one of these switches, then what you end up with is e to the minus as times the Laplace transform of the function f shifted. Right. So, so for example, if you were to do the Laplace transform of t times the heavy side function of t minus one, right? So this would be a switch. You do nothing until time one, and then at time one, you start uh, forcing with t. Then this formula says we can write that as e to the minus s times the Laplace transform of the function one, but evaluated at t plus one. Sorry, the function t, but evaluated at t plus one. So that's t plus one, right? And so then using linearity, we could write this as one over s squared times e to the minus s plus one over s times e to the minus s. Okay, very good. This next property is so important that I'm gonna label it a lemma. Right. And so this is what happens when you take the Laplace transform of a derivative. So Laplace transform of f prime is equal to s times the Laplace transform of f minus f of zero. So here f of zero is just a constant f evaluated zero. Okay. So of course, this is key because it's what we're going to be using to uh, apply the Laplace transform to differential equations. Okay, so for the proof, Laplace transform of f prime, well, by definition, that's the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st times the derivative of f, 
right? So of course, this is asking to be integrated by parts. Uh, clearly, when you integrate by parts, you're going to have something that you differentiate, something you integrate. And here we have a derivative, so we should integrate that. So let's choose e u to be e to the minus st, and then the rest will be dv, so f prime of t dt, right with these choices, du is going to become minus s e to the minus st times dt, and v is just f of t. Right? And so we end up with u times v, so e to the minus st f of t evaluated between zero and infinity, and then minus the integral of um, v du, so we get uh, minus s e to the minus st times f of t dt, right? So, okay, so let's stare at this term. When we evaluate at infinity, we're going to get zero. And so it's just what we get when we evaluate at zero, so minus f of zero. And then the next term, we have minus and minus, that's plus. And then this s, we can pull out of the integral because we're integrating with respect to t. So we just end up with s times the Laplace transform of f. OK, so that proves the lemma. And uh, we can use this formula Defined, for example, Laplace transform of f double prime, right? Well, because f double prime is just the derivative of f prime. So this is s times Laplace transform of f prime minus f prime at zero. And then we use the lemma again. This is s times s times the Laplace transform of f minus f of zero. Right? And then if we expand that out, we end up with s squared times the plus transform of f minus s times f of zero minus f prime of zero. Right? So this is wonderful because you started out with two derivatives of f and you ended up with no derivatives of f. Right? It turned taking two derivatives to multiplying by s squared. Right? plus some other things coming from the initial conditions. So let's go ahead and think about how we would use this to solve a differential equation. Here's a very easy differential equation that we already know uh, a couple of methods how to solve. Suppose we had y double prime plus 16y equal to zero y of 0 equals 3, y prime of 0 equals 5. Okay, well, then you could just take Laplace transform. Right, so it tells you the Laplace transform of y double prime plus 16y is equal to zero, because the plus transform of zero is zero. Okay, so then using linearity, uh, the left-hand side is equal to the plus transform of y double prime plus 16 times the plus transform of y, right? And the plus transform of, double, of y double prime is by this formula we just worked out, s squared times the plus transform of y minus s times y of zero minus y prime of zero. And then we have still this plus 16 Laplace transform of y, right? So, okay, that means I have s squared plus 16 times the Laplace transform of y. And then I could move these other terms to the other side of the equality. So I would get s times y of zero, y of zero is three and then y prime of zero, which is five, right? So now I can solve for the Laplace transform of y. Uh, 
right? And I get that it is 3s plus 5 divided by s squared plus 16. Okay, so because the Laplace transform is invertible, we just have to recognize what is this the Laplace transform of, right? So, okay, we have a fraction with a s squared plus 16 on the bottom. So if we scroll up to where we talked about the Laplace transform of the trigonometric functions, you see that for cosine, you have s over s squared plus omega squared. And for sine, you have omega over s squared plus omega squared. So then what that means is that we should rewrite this fraction we ended up with as three times s over s squared plus 16 and then five over four times four over s squared plus 16. And then we can recognize that y has to be equal to three times cosine of four t plus five over four sine of four t. All right, so we invert the uh, Laplace transform, not by computing an inverse, but by recognizing the Laplace transform we had, we ended up with as being the Laplace transform of this function. Okay. And in that way, we have solved this differential equation. Okay, of course, this formula we found for the second derivative, we could keep going. So um, by iterating, The lemma, you can see that the Laplace transform of a function when you've taken k derivatives would be s to the k times the Laplace transform of the original function minus s to the k minus 1 times the value of the function at 0, s to the k minus 2 times the value of the derivative of the function at 0, and so on, until you get to k minus one times derivative evaluated at zero. Okay. We can also use the lemma to find other Laplace transforms. So for example, right, if f of t is equal to t, right? So I told you, you could work this out by integrating by parts. You can also work this out by using the lemma, right? Because if f of t is equal to t, then the derivative of f is equal to one. And the value of the function at zero is zero. So the lemma tells us that the Laplace transform of one is equal to S times the Laplace transform of F minus zero, right? But we already worked out the Laplace transform of one is equal to one over S. So this tells us one over S is equal to S times the Laplace transform of F. And so Laplace transform of F is equal to one over S squared, right? Just as advertised before. Right, you could do the same trick and work out the Laplace transform of t squared. The right, Laplace transform of t squared would be two divided by s cubed. And more generally, the Laplace transform of t to the k, right? would be k factorial dividing s to the k plus one. Right. Then using some of the formulas we worked out before, it's then easy to see Laplace transform of t to the k e to the sigma t, right, which is the sort of term we're used to getting from solving homogeneous uh, linear ODE with constant coefficient, uh, 
uh, this would be k factorial divided by s minus sigma raised to the k plus one. Right, because multiplying by e to the sigma t just takes the Laplace transform and shifts it by sigma. Okay. Well, when we're solving differential equations, using the Laplace transform, often requires using partial fractions. So you may want to review from pre-calculus and calculus uh, how to use partial fractions. Here's an example. Suppose you want to solve y prime plus 2y equals e to the minus t with y of 0 equal to 0. So again, this is an easy equation. We now know at least two ways of solving it. Here's a third one using the Laplace transform. So we'll just take the Laplace transform of both sides of the equation. All right On the left-hand side, we get Laplace transform of y prime plus 2 times Laplace transform of y. On the right-hand side, we get Laplace transform of e to the minus t. Right? Okay. So we can rewrite this. Let's use the notation capital F for the Laplace transform of y. So the, the derivative would give us s times the Laplace transform, so s times capital F, minus y of 0. Right, And then I have plus 2 times the Laplace transform, which I'm just going to write as f of s. And then on the right-hand side, I have 1 over s plus 1 because it's the Laplace transform of e to the minus t. Now, our initial condition tells us y of 0 is 0, so I can get rid of this y of 0 term. And so I can rewrite this as s plus 2 times capital F of s is equal to 1 over s plus 1. Right. So that's the same as saying that capital F of s is equal to 1 over s plus 1 times s plus 2, right? So we're almost done. We just need to recognize this as the Laplace transform of something, and then we can just take the inverse Laplace transform, OK? However, this is not one of the functions that's shown up as the Laplace transform of something so far. So we need to use partial fractions to write this as something over s plus 1 plus something over s plus 2. Right, So these are polynomials of degree one. So we're just going to have some constant here and some constant here. right? And remember how partial fractions works is you can just multiply both sides of this equation by s plus 1 times s plus 2, and then um, figure out what constants you need to use to get equality. In this case, it's easy enough. You could see it just by staring. We're going to have a 1 here and a minus 1 here. Right. OK, but that's great, because if the Laplace transform of the function we're looking for is uh, is equal to this, now we can recognize what uh, functions you need to start with to get this Laplace transform. Right. So we see that y of t is equal to e to the minus t minus e to the minus 2t. OK, so we often need to use partial fractions. Uh, it also often requires completing a square. So let's do an example. Suppose you know that the uh, Laplace transform of a function is equal to uh, 1 over s squared plus 3s plus 6. 
and then you want to find what function you started with. Okay, so let's write this rational function. Uh, okay, I want to complete the square on the bottom, right? So what I'll do is I will add 3 over 2 squared and subtract 3 over 2 squared, right? So because I'm adding and subtracting the same thing, I haven't made any changes, right? But of course, I chose 3 over 2 because then the first three terms are s plus 3 over 2 squared, and then I have plus 15 over 4 left over. Okay. And now we're starting to be in good shape because this looks a lot like um, having a sum of squares on the bottom. So let's write this as s plus 3 over 2 squared plus square root of 15 over 4 squared. Right? And then, so this is looking a lot like the Laplace transform of sine. Uh, so I'll just need to, well, Here's what I want. I want to have uh, square root of 15 divided by 2 over s plus 3 halves squared plus the square root of 15 divided by 2 squared. But I have to pay for that by putting it here. I have to divide by square root of 15 divided by 2. Right, but now that's great because this we do recognize as Laplace transform of a sine. So we can conclude that our original function f of t is equal to this constant, right? Two divided by square root of 15 times e to the minus three halves t, right? Because the function is shifted by three halves and then sine of square root of 15 divided by 2 times t. OK, let's work out an example where we have jump discontinuities or uh, a non-smooth forcing term. Suppose we want to solve y double prime plus 4y is equal to sine of t minus the heavy side function evaluated at t minus pi times sine of t with initial condition y of 0 is 0, y prime of 0 is 0. Okay, so this forcing term, this right-hand side, what's that look like? Well, what you're doing is you're taking sine of t between zero and pi, so just one bump of sine, and then you're setting the forcing term to zero. You're switching it off. Okay? So taking the Laplace transform, Laplace transform of y double prime plus four times Laplace transform of y, is equal to Laplace transform of sine of t minus the Laplace transform of the heavy side function times sine. Okay, so we can write this as right the Laplace transform of taking two derivatives that's s squared times Laplace transform of y, right, and then I get minus s times y of zero minus y prime of zero, right? But but our initial conditions are zero, so both of these terms cancel out. Then we have plus four times the plus transform of y. And then what is this? Well, the plus transform of sine, that one's easy. It's just one over s squared plus one. Then the term with the heavy side function, well, remember what the heavy side function does is it's going to give us an exponential factor out front, so e to the minus pi s in this case. And then Laplace transform of sine, but now shifted by pi. Right? Sine of t plus pi is just minus sine of t. So that means I can write this as one over square root, sorry, one over s squared plus one, 
minus this e to the minus pi s times minus one over s squared plus one. Okay, so that means that if we solve for L of Y, we would get one plus e to the minus pi s divided by s squared plus one times s squared plus four. <clears throat> okay, and so again, we wanna use partial fractions. So here we have s squared plus one. So we're going to have something above that plus s squared plus four. So we're going to have something above that. And then I'm going to have this term of one plus e to the minus pi s. Okay. So in general, you would have some linear poly uh, polynomial here and some linear polynomial here. And then you use partial fractions to figure out what you get. This case, again, is simple enough that you could do it just by staring. One third here and minus one third here works. So we can write this as just writing everything out to make it easy to take the inverse Laplace transform. We get one third of one over s squared plus one minus one over s squared plus four and then plus e to the minus pi s over s squared plus one minus e to the minus pi s over s squared plus four, right? And writing it out like that is useful because then we can recognize each of these terms as a Laplace transform and just invert it, right? So. I have this one third, and then, so this first one, of course, is sine of t. The next one, sine of 2t. And then that exponential, well, that comes from having a heavy side function. So we have this heavy side switch t minus pi times sine of t minus pi, right? Which is just <clears throat> minus sine of t. And then again, switch with now sine of two times t minus pi, which is the same as sine of 2t. OK. Uh, now, as a remark, let's consider the general second order linear equation. constant coefficients. So what does it look like when you're thinking about it in terms of the Laplace transform? Okay, so the equation looks like, before we do anything, y double prime plus a1 times y prime plus a naught y equals f. And taking Laplace transform, By taking Laplace transform, we get uh, L times the second derivative of Y plus A1 of L of the first derivative plus A naught L of Y equals L of F, right? And rewriting this, expanding things out, well, when you take Laplace transform as the second derivative, you get S squared times Laplace transform of Y minus s y of zero minus y prime of zero, right? Then I'm gonna have a one times what I get from taking the Laplace transform of the first derivative. So s times Laplace transform of y minus a one times uh, y of zero, and then plus a zero Laplace transform of y equals Laplace transform of f. And so by grouping like terms, we have 
s squared plus a one s plus a naught times the Laplace transform of y, and then minus y prime zero plus a one y of zero plus y of zero times s, and all of that is equal to the Laplace transform of f. Okay, now notice that this coefficient, this is exactly the characteristic polynomial of the equation we started with. And then this other term, well, this is like an initial condition polynomial, right? So you can solve, in a sense, for the Laplace transform for y itself as the Laplace inverse transform of the plus transform of f divided by the characteristic polynomial, right? Plus the inverse of the plus transform of the initial condition polynomial divided by the characteristic polynomial, right? So on the one hand, you see that uh, partial fractions are obviously going to come into play because here you have a, a rational function and you want to take its inverse Laplace transform, right? Um, on the other hand, let's notice that this is, uh, well, the terms are zero input and zero state solutions. So in the zero input, so here, notice that the initial conditions aren't involved at all. So this is the same as what you would get if you were to solve with uh, zero initial conditions. Whereas the zero state, right? Here, the initial conditions are involved, but F is not involved at all. So this is what you would get if you had zero forcing term. Right, so the homogeneous equation, right? Okay, very good. So next I'm gonna talk about historical context. So feel free to stop watching here. What I talk about next will not be on the homework or on the exam. Okay, so the historical context I thought I'd talk about today, right? It's not surprising given context, given that we've just spent the whole lecture talking about the Laplace transform, let's talk about Laplace. So Pierre Simon Laplace, right? Uh, he was alive between 1749 and 1827, right? So for context, Euler, Euler was born 1707 and died 1783. So their lives overlapped quite a bit. Uh, you've heard of Laplace, well now from the Laplace transform, but no doubt you've also heard of the Laplacian, right? The Laplacian, for example, in three dimensions uh, would be um, d by dx squared plus d by dy squared plus d by dz squared, right? So when you're an Rn, the Laplacian is just take the second derivative in every direction and add those together. This is a really important uh, differential operator. It shows up in, in all sorts of mathematical physics. Uh, when we get around to talking about partial differential equations, we will be talking more about the Laplacian. Laplace was a French mathematician and theoretical astronomer who was so famous in his own time that he was known as the Newton of France. His main interests were in celestial mechanics and the theory of probability, and you could say in personal advancement. Laplace was born in Normandy, and he was initially studying theology, like many of the mathematicians we've talked about. His parents wanted him to, to join the church, uh, but once he decided to switch to math, he uh, left um, the city he was studying in, which is at Kent, 
and went to Paris. Uh, this was at age 19 when he still hadn't finished his degree, so he didn't have a degree. But he had a letter of recommendation from one of his professors who he had managed to uh, greatly impress. Uh, this was a letter to addressed to a very prominent scientist, Jean Clerond d'Alembert. Uh, you've probably heard of him as the uh, one of the co-editors of the French Encyclopedia. Um, Laplace managed to impress D'Alembert and then let D'Alembert arrange for Laplace to get a teaching position at the Ecole Militaire. Uh, this was not, not a great um, position in itself, but it, it uh, allowed Laplace to live in Paris and, and work on his math. Um, not long after that, in 1773, he began to work on celestial mechanics, and he chose a very interesting and difficult problem to work on. Uh, how to explain why Jupiter's orbit appeared to be continuously shrinking while Saturn's orbit kept expanding. Right? So as soon as you try to apply Newtonian gravitation to more than two objects, the interactions get really complex and it's impossible to find exact solutions. Much later, this would lead to Poincaré's discovery of chaos theory. Uh, and a bit earlier, it had led Newton to conclude that divine intervention would periodically be required to preserve the system in equilibrium. Uh, Leibniz, who as you know, was not uh, too fond of Newton, uh, commented in a letter that Newton must not have a, a very good view of God or he would have uh, allowed God to make a perfect clock. Euler had twice tried to explain the discrepancy in the orbits and to establish the stability of the solar system in 1748, so right before uh, Laplace was born, and 1752. Uh, both of these uh, attempts by Euler won prizes uh, but he didn't manage uh, to do what he wanted. His second attempt, Euler's second attempt, was really important because it set up the method of perturbations. So here the idea is that you start by saying that the mass of the planets compared to the sun are so small so as to be insignificant. So you just think about solving gravitational problems with the sun having some mass and the planets having zero mass. And if you do that, then it's great because you end up with perfect elliptical orbits around the sun, well, with the sun at a focus. And then what you do is you perturb the situation in terms of some parameter, let's call it R. This parameter is uh, allowing the mass of the various planets to, to interact with each other. And you end up with like a power series approximation in terms of R. So what Laplace did was he considered only the first order part of this power series. He ignored everything with uh, powers of R greater than one. And he was able to show that uh, eventually, the not, not in 1773, but eventually Laplace was able to show that if you look at, say, the longest radii of the planet's orbits, right? So you look at the, the major semi-axis of the ellipsis, then that remains unchanged when pulled on by the other planets, right? And, and, and so he was able to conclude that the solar system was stable. He also explained, and this is what he did in 1773, uh, the variation in the orbits of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So what he realized was that there was a resonance uh, between these orbits. So, so the ratio of the mean motions of the planets is such that um, the uh, it gets really close to being a fraction of small numbers. And so they perturb each other's orbits disproportionately. Uh, his work in 1773 was acknowledged as one of the most important advances in physical astronomy since Newton, and it won him associate membership in the prestigious uh, French Academy of Sciences, or Académie des Sciences, uh, later that year. This was a really big deal because the Academy had a, a fixed number of members, and so to get a, a membership, you have to wait for somebody to die. Membership was for life. Uh, throughout the 1770s, Laplace worked out a program of research in probability and celestial mechanics. Interestingly, um, probability seems to have 
uh, really come up for him because when he was thinking about how the um, uh, gravitational uh, impact of comets would affect the orbits of the planets. And so comets were just such a rare thing that he wanted to uh, approach them using probability. Uh, but yeah, so he had a program in, in probability, celestial mechanics, and by the 1780s, he was one of the most important and influential scientists in, in the world. Uh, his rise in prominence did not lead necessarily to good relationships with his colleagues. Uh, D'Alembert, for example, uh, felt that Laplace was making his work obsolete. Uh, but more importantly, Laplace had no modesty. And he was open about uh, considering himself the best mathematician in France, uh, which he almost surely was um, uh, at the moment, at the in the 1780s, at the early 1780s. Uh, later, he would be joined by Lagrange. Uh, Laplace also had a terrible habit, which, um, however, was more accepted back then, of not giving credit to other people in his own work. So he wrote these really long. Uh, treatises on uh, celestial mechanics and on probability, and he would just use work of other people without mentioning that it wasn't original to him, which of course now uh, would uh, be a very serious offense. Uh, we would consider him a plagiarist with in today's standards. Uh, in 1784, Laplace was appointed uh, examiner at the Royal Art Artillery Corps. Right? So he was one of the people who was uh, examining uh, students when they were finishing. Right, Artillery is part of the military, but it uses a lot of math. So uh, mathematicians were involved. In 1785, one of the students that Laplace was uh, examining uh, was a 16-year-old um, Napoleon Bonaparte. In fact, this position of Laplace uh, allowed him to become well known to the ministers of the government and others in positions of power in France. Uh, in 1787, uh, Laplace was joined in Paris by Lagrange. Uh, Lagrange was good enough to rival uh, Laplace's talents. And, uh, and in fact, a lot of the work that uh, Laplace did on the stability of the solar system was in, um, in communication and rivalry with uh, Lagrange. 1787 is when uh, Lagrange arrived. Only two years later, 1789, you have the beginning of the French Revolution. Uh, Laplace uh, stayed in Paris until the terror started, so 1793. And then he, uh, he ran away to the countryside because he wanted to stay alive. Uh, the academy was abolished um, during the Reign of Terror. Once Robespierre was executed in uh, July 1794, uh, the Reign of Terror ends, Laplace returned to Paris. By 1795, the French Republic had been replaced by the Directory, and the uh, Academy was reborn. Uh, and Laplace reobtained his position there, as well as uh, a position in the Bureau of Longitudes, uh, an institution charged with the improvement of nautical navigation, standardization of timekeeping, and making measurements both terrestrial and astronomical. Uh, Laplace was also uh, put in charge of the French Observatory. In 1796, uh, Laplace proposed the nebular hypothesis, right? So this is the idea that the solar system originated from uh, like contracting and cooling a cloud of... Um, large, slowly rotating gas. Uh, and right, so and then this coalesces into the sun and then the planets. Uh, the, Laplace wasn't the first one to come up with this hypothesis, although he seems to have come up with it independently. Uh, another person very famous who came up with this hypothesis was Immanuel Kant, the philosopher. Uh, elsewhere, uh, Laplace seems to have been the first person to uh, propose a black hole. So he thought about a, uh, a, um, a point with so much gravity that light itself would not be able to uh, escape the gravitational attraction. In November 1799, right, Napoleon seized power in the coup of 18 Brumaire. And seeking to give his new regime some prestige and legitimacy, he appointed Laplace as Minister of the Interior. Right, So this is the person in charge of police and internal security. 
Now, this was never meant to be a long-term appointment. This was just for borrowing prestige. And once Napoleon has secured his position, he replaced Laplace with uh, his own brother, Lucien Bonaparte, who had played a key role in the coup of 18 Brumaire. He had been in charge of the Senate when it happened. Much later, when uh, Napoleon was in his second exile on St. Helena, uh, Napoleon ungenerously wrote in his memoirs that Laplace had carried the spirit of the infinitesimals into uh, his administration of the uh, Ministry of the Interior. However, at the time, Napoleon and uh, Laplace got along just fine. And when Napoleon removed uh, Laplace from the ministry, he gave him a position in the Senate. Uh, one story from around this time says that uh, Napoleon asked Laplace how it was possible that his work on celestial mechanics made no mention of God. And Laplace said, I had no need of that hypothesis. This is probably just a reference to uh, how Newton had evoked divine intervention to explain the stability of the universe. And Laplace uh, was able to explain the stability using just natural forces. Uh, Laplace got along well enough with Napoleon that in 1806, he was made Count of the Empire, right? Of course, by this point, uh, there was an empire, right? So Napoleon, right, so that right after the coup of um, 18 Brumaire, Napoleon outmaneuvered his co-conspirators and became a, a dictator uh, with the title First Consul in 1800. At the time, uh, the position was for 10 years, but in 1802, Napoleon had uh, scored some great victories and um, and he signed a peace with England. And so he celebrated by promoting himself to first consul for life. Then in 1804, he went the whole way and um, promoted himself to emperor of the French. And Laplace's son, Emile, uh, joined the, the army of uh, Napoleon and he fought for Napoleon from 1805 to 1814, so all the way to the first abdication. Uh, however, after Napoleon returned from his disastrous 1812 invasion of Russia, his relationship with the mathematician Laplace soured. And Laplace supported the restoration of the Bourbon in 1814 and supported the monarchy from there on. In 1817, he was... Um, rewarded for his support by being made Marquis de, de Laplace by uh, King Louis XVIII. Uh, Laplace's work on probability started to appear in 1812, right? So the same year that Napoleon decided it would be a good idea to invade Russia and then stay there for the winter. The first edition of Laplace's work on probability was dedicated to Napoleon Lagrand. Uh, but for obvious reasons, that dedication was removed from subsequent editions. Uh, Laplace's work on probability, just like his work on celestial mechanics, was extremely influential. He worked out some fundamental results in statistics, he developed Bayesian methods, he developed the method of least squares, and he worked out the central limit theorem. Uh, it is while working on probability that he gave uh, another statement that's really famous about Laplace uh, because of, of its strong causal determinism. So basically Laplace claimed that if it was possible to know at any given moment, all of the positions of all of the things in the universe and all of the forces acting on them at that time, then a great enough intelligence would be able to determine from that knowledge, all of the past and all of the future. Right. This is often referred to as Laplace's demon, although he did not refer to the intelligence as a demon. And you often hear about this when you when you read about the great change in science that came from quantum mechanics, because this this notion, this determinism, uh, it it just stops working when when you learn that that at a fundamental level things are probabilistic and not deterministic. Anyway, Laplace died in Paris in 1827 at the age of 77. We'll stop there and pick it up next time.